Hello everyone and welcome back to the Skyrim audio adventure. I'm always so pleased to get these episodes out when I can because it's just every production cycle is such a journey. This one in particular because my computer or my laptop, which is where I do most of my work for this show, kicked to the bucket and I had to scramble to recover all of my files and get a new laptop and set it up and finish the work on it. And so this one in particular felt like a trial. I am joined at the booth today by Jorge, or George, the the sound booth cat. Wow! <laughs> who is uh, who has decided that my sound booth is now his favorite place to hang out? So, yeah, we got a sound booth cat here. So now I shan't delay any longer. I present unto you Chapter Four of Season Two of the Skyrim Audio Adventure. Tundra Roads. Legs long like reaching arms skipped and flitted down the pine bark. It inspected the base of the trunk carefully, its dark eyes as discerning and unknowable as the fairies it often resembled. All appeared to be in order down here, or whatever order looked like to a creeper. As it spun, its pointed beak likening it to a sundial, it paused. A red bush next to it had moved unexpectedly. The bird tilted its head, trying to confirm the odd happening. Then suddenly leapt into the air and darted away, spiraling up to the canopy. With the tiny watcher gone, the curious red bush moved again, extricating itself from the foliage around it. A wiry girl in hide garb crouched beneath striking auburn locks. She placed a hand on the trunk and deftly stepped around it, making sure to lean just so as the bow on her back didn't catch on anything. She had been assured that one day she would move with such deft ease the bow would be as an extension of her body. However, for the moment it still felt awkward and cumbersome. A doe was grazing somewhere up ahead. She had caught a glimpse of its white tail in the weeds some twenty minutes ago, Unfortunately, she hadn't been in a position to shift without making noise, and the deer only moved further out of view. Eventually, it had been safe for her to pursue. Now she was on her second approach, a creep down a crumbling embankment to a densely wooded gully. With time, the gully would spill out into the larger valley. Then things would open up, yes, but it would be much harder to corner her prey. Moving with an unrefined yet delicate grace, the young girl picked her way down the slope, taking care not to send any rocks scattering below. She wished desperately for a chain of boulders she could leap down. If she didn't descend quickly, the trail would go cold. However, such speed carried its own risks. Perhaps she could tuck into a ball and roll down the hill, pretending to be a rock herself. Then again, she supposed, the doe would flee at any noise, as is the caution of prey. So creep she did drawing example from the tiny bird on the tree. The sun seemed a three-headed thing as it peered at her through the shifting clouds. The day had all the trappings of a chilly one, but the clouds seemed more like a massive quilt holding the sun's heat to the earth. Sweat soon broke out on her forehead as she snuck. She felt a twinge in her ankle as it rolled over a stone. She proved her grace once more, dancing silently along her path with nary a stumble in her stride. The pain was nothing when the hunt was afoot. Tucking into the trees, she wound ahead, more confident now for the cover. However, with cover came lower boughs, and she found she could not fight the urge to carry the bow in her hand, maneuvering it like a dancing pikeman through the thickets. It was not a bad thing, she figured, to have it at the ready. 
every few yards she'd stop and listen. Hoof falls, grazing, some animal cry or grunt, anything to help her zero in on her target. Her luck seemed to be running dry until her ninth stop. She had scanned with her ears and was about to start moving again, when a stumped tree to her left adjusted the bend of its legs and became, suddenly, the doe, resting on a bed of alder leaves. So silent had been her approach, and so inconspicuous had been the deer, one might have tripped upon the other had their meeting not been beaten by the ever-fickle herald of sight. Moving slow as the clouds, the girl reached up to her quiver. Chance was with her. She would not have to turn her body to draw the string. The creature was already in line with her shoulders. The arrow came loose from its fitting, and the steel tip ran up the other shafts with a hiss she hoped was lost in the hum of the woods. She raised it free, swaying like a tree as she brought it around. She was about to touch the knock to the string when the doe's ears perked. Both were so still, the stones, it seemed, held more life. Sight, that fickle thing, had just turned to its other face. The doe bolted. The girl knocked her arrow, led the fleeing prey, and shot. The draw had been rushed, and she must have twisted her wrist as the arrow listed in its flight, tail waggling noticeably. It rattled ineffectually off an alder, and the deer was gone. Pulling another arrow, she took off in pursuit. A branch scratched her arm as she followed the flickering white tail through the woods. She hoped it wouldn't affect her draw. Hurtling a root, she came to the mouth of the valley, where the trees thinned and the land spilled out to the tundra. She saw the doe clearly, now some hundred yards away and getting smaller. She darted forward and was caught around the chest by a strong arm. The impact nearly knocked the wind out of her, and the girl coughed and stumbled as she took in the newcomer. A tall, imperious woman, with shoulder-length fiery hair and a heavily freckled face. Her jaw was elegant, yet her chin was square. Under raised brows, hazel eyes stopped the young girl in her place. Ayala, the woman began. Were you seriously about to take off chasing that deer from here to Iverstead? Running through creeks and mammoth herds? Climbing over barrows and boulders? No! The girl panted indignantly. I would have caught up with it over by that next hill! And then shoot it when you barely have any breath in you? Would you have drawn your knife when you ran out of arrows? The Nord woman wore a leather vest tightly fitted with scale-like steel. The scales were tucked into the leather, leaving her movements silent. Resting on her armored breast was a pendant of dull metal bearing an etching of a double-bladed axe. Like the girl, she carried a bow on her back, only hers was not the dull brown of honed wood, but a bizarre pale gold. Its edges were sharper somehow, embossed with the sweeping wings of an eagle. No, I... The girl pouted. It just came out of nowhere! Why was it just sitting there like that? Don't begrudge here, scene, for your misfortune. Excuses won't fill your stomach. What could you have done better? The girl scoffed and rolled her eyes, earning her a smack on the back of the head. Ayala, the woman said dangerously. I suppose I could have just drawn and shot the moment I saw it. Then I would have been the first to move and might have gotten off a clean shot. Good. Also remember to look for grazing sign and footprints. The deer shouldn't have surprised you. What footprints? It's mostly leaves here. Are any of the leaves broken? No, I... The girl cut herself off as she looked around. Oh. She groaned, smacking her palms to her temples. Blazes, girl. I'll be dead before you're ready for your trial. The woman said, reaching down and digging under the leaves. You might want to see about camouflage, too. Break up your outline a bit. You can use foliage or specific clothes. Or paints. Coming upright, she took the girl's face in one hand and started drawing lines of dirt across it. Something like that, she said with a tilt of her head. I'm no artist. Brack is actually much better at this than I. He could be right here with us and we wouldn't know. Is he here? The woman squinted after the deer innocently. Hmm? The girl gave her an accusing gaze. I know you can tell. 
The impressive Nord grinned at this. No, he's not. The young huntress kicked a rock. Well, what now? The woman readied her bow and knocked an arrow. The hunt waits for no one. But the deer is long gone. I wouldn't say that, she said, pointing. The young girl stared out to the tundra, and after a moment's searching, spotted the deer, standing on a distant bluff some five hundred yards away, looking back at them. Ayala, the woman said, drawing the child's eyes back to her. The path ahead of you is a steep climb, one that will hurt you, trick you, and knock you down at every chance. No that you'll never make it up if you despise the path for its winding. Or even more, despise yourself for your failures. Know yourself. Adapt. And climb. Hazel eyes poured into slate blue for a moment as the valley breathed around them. I... I will. The girl stammered. The warrior smiled softly. One day, I hope you'll believe yourself when you say that. No question. Why do we climb? The girl was puzzled, but gave the first answer that occurred to her. To get to higher places? (laughs) For the view. The woman chuckled kindly. Here, I'll give you a peek. Back muscles rippled under fabric like waves whipped up on a lake. The woman drew her bow back, not to her usual anchor near her ear, but all the way back to her right shoulder. The strange bow creaked at the unusual tension, the blade of the steel head nearly kissing the wings. She took a long breath in and a longer breath out as she extended her lead finger and lifted her aim to the clouds. Just for a moment, all was silent. The archer, statuesque, had run out of breath. Then, she tilted her head slightly, bringing her ear out of harm's way, and shot. The wind of the whipping bow pulled at the girl's hair. It fluttered before her eyes, and the bolt was sent singing through the air. The pair stood still, watching the arrow as it bore out its ambitions for the heavens, before slowly nosing down and falling toward the distant bluff. It was said that a well-made arrow struck home like the fury of a god. Ayala didn't know what fury her mother held toward the deer, but her divinity could not have been better proven had thunder rolled across the sky. The winds of the night's flight had bitten at his bones. His fingers were stiff and numb from clinging to the hide of the monster he called friend. By the mercy of that beast, he had been stashed like loot in a hay pile and permitted a brief sleep. However, with the rising of the sun came the rousing of the farm, and the hunter was rudely awakened by the hot kiss of a curious mare. Oh. Raising his arms blindly and rolling away from the slobber, he blinked awake, eyes bleary and confused. Stranger, meet Pebble. Came Ayala's familiar voice. Hi, Pebble. The hunter croaked, wiping off his face. Glancing around, he found himself on the outskirts of Pelagia Farm. The spire of Dragon's Reach Castle shone bright as ever in the distance, and to his right, the throat of the world bore a halo from the approaching sun. Pebble made another pass at him, and he couldn't be bothered to move as her big nose must what hair he had left. He tilted his head back and spotted the wolf of Whiterun, clad in the same armor as their first meeting, sitting on a fence above him, chin in hands. Her steel blue eyes met his and held. He would have expected one of her jabs by now, but the huntress simply watched him, expression as plain as one reading a memoir. Eventually, he raised an eyebrow. 
Do I look good from up there? Better than some. She answered in a voice that matched her face. Hmm, well that's something. Worse than most. There it is. The hunter sighed, using the fence to pull himself to his feet. So, what's, uh, what's going on? The sidelong smile she gave him didn't linger. The net has been cast. Now we sift through our catch. Do the checkpoints know what to look for? Their hounds have the girl's scent. Ayela opened a pouch at her belt and pulled out a torn strip of cloth. As do we. What's more, I passed on your many insights and they are on their way throughout the hold. I met with the circle while you were asleep. Farkas took a few out to Greymore, Vilkas is leading the search north, and Skior and Aethys are holding the slopes behind us. What about Bracknell? Was he here? <laughs> oh no, he's not that nimble yet. He's scrounging for more information up in the city. Codlack and the rest are sorting through merchant carts. Much to everyone's chagrin, as I understand it. Gotcha. The hunter said, nodding bitterly. Don't worry, I'm sure you'll get a chance to see him when this is over. Where are we off to, then? We ride east to Valtheim Towers and the Falls of Maramir. Uh, just the two of us? The hunter asked, looking around. No more companions or, uh, shield siblings, as you say? Nope, just the two of us. Is that wise? What if we actually find a vampire? The huntress kicked her feet out nonchalantly. In that case, I'm as good in a fight as any three of the others combined, and I have you to make sure the fiends don't get the drop on me. I feel like you're putting too much stock in an ability that I have never had the chance to test. With a flourish, Ayla dropped off the fence and arched her back in a stretch. You know, stranger, I heard something very interesting back in Riverwood. See, apparently this young boy who'd been missing nearly two days turned up safe and sound just that evening. He was talking all about the curious ranger who helped him find the way home. The hunter slapped a hand over his eyes as Ayala, gaze unrelenting, stepped towards him. Strange fellow by the sounds of him. Kind and clever, yes, but he was always listening for things the boy couldn't hear and speaking to people the boy just couldn't see. She was now well into his personal space. So, basically, if you truly believe that everything you've done so far has been dumb luck and you are going to be of no use to me, I can take you by the scruff, toss you back up your mountain, and go face this thing alone. Or you can string your bow, wipe the milk off your chin, and accept that maybe, just maybe, you are not a normal person. The hunter kept his eyes fixed on a space a few inches above her head and sighed hard through his nose. Fine, he eventually said. I've always wanted to see the falls. Ayla grinned and stepped towards her mare. We'll make a few stops along the way, and of course we're searching any carriage we come across. Oh, the life of a highwayman, then. <laughs> Only if they're carrying something valuable. Wait, seriously? <laughs> no! Do you really think so little of me? Quite the opposite, actually, he said, following. I imagine you could rob a caravan blindfolded, with one arm tied behind your back. The Wolf of Whiterun paused at this, auburn hair catching around her ears. Oh was all she said, strangely. Backtracking a bit, did you say we would ride? Yeah, on Pebble here. Both of us. Of course. Don't worry about her. She's a white run mare. Could probably handle four of us if it came to it. The hunter looked the admittedly robust animal up and down. I don't doubt that. Ayela ran a hand down the mare's neck. Then what's the problem? This isn't your first ride, right? The hunter gave her a bashful look. The huntress's jaw dropped. Are you serious? Her hermit, remember? I know, but never once? Even as a child? The man shrugged. Sorry, but I only ride werewolves. Hey! The huntress jabbed a finger at him. If you ever tell someone about that, I'll- Yo, what? Eat my dinner again? Ayala squinted at him. Yeah, I will. The half-breed faltered. Weedy retort dying on his lips. Uh, please don't. <laughs> my, my. Ayala chuckled. 
I dare say you're more scared of my appetite than you are of my claws. Well, I've actually seen you stay your claws once or twice. Ouch! She exclaimed, feigning injury. Hark! The mysterious ranger is barbed as a gaff. Truly, I have been caught! After her dramatics, the huntress took up the horse's reins and led them over to the fence. No time like the present. Get up there, you big lark. Were the hunter not perfectly comfortable with this particular inadequacy, what followed might have been humiliating. In fact, it was merely hilarious. Pebble, being the amiable mare she was, gave him two attempts at hoisting himself into the saddle before entirely losing faith in the process. By the third try, she was moving away from him as soon as his foot found the stirrup, forcing him to hop after her or be pulled into a disastrous split. Then it was Aela's turn to help by giving him a boost. She practically tossed him over the mount twice. By the time he was settled in the saddle, he was covered in dirt, hot with a morning sweat, and breathless with laughter. Aela, a giggly mess herself, pulled herself up in front of him with ease. Taking the reins, she looked over her shoulder and met his foolish grin with one of her own. It was in that moment when something in the huntress's eyes shifted. Something inside closed itself off. What was bright dulled and hardened. The smile fell from her face as she turned to the road. It happened too quick for the hunter to make any remark. In fact, he'd barely noticed it when the beast below jolted into motion and he was thoroughly occupied. Through hay bales and pumpkin patches they went, away from the farm and off across the open tundra. High above the world of brigands and peasants, beneath spires where eagles nest and flying wishes take their rest at the seat of power in Whiterun Hold, noble tones rung out in debate. Intel from Captain Brew is that there may yet be one living member of the family. It's a supposition, Rongar. Nothing more. I agree. The sooner the farm is available for auction, the sooner crop production can resume. We will not deny the child her birthright. We have no proof that she is alive. And we have no proof that she isn't. Then how long do we wait? How long will we twiddle our thumbs while wheat grows black on the stalk and grapes go sour on the vine? Enough! The voice of Balgriff the Greater, Jarl and Lord of Whiterun, rang out in the main hall of Dragon's Reach Castle. His thanes, seated at long tables, fell silent at his call. The men and women of his court looked up expectantly, donning fur collars and braided epaulets, their shirts, doublets, and gowns embroidered with scintillating filigree. The Jarl sat high on his throne, stroking weary brow between thumb and forefinger. My Jarl, piped up a redguard man with a shaved head and a permanent haughty pout to his lips. You are the lord of this land. Family ownership, precious as it is, does not override your authority. I bid you exercise your lordship in- The speaker stiffened under the Jarl's cobalt gaze. Nazim, he said, voice little higher than a whisper, but in the silence it reached all corners of the great hall. He turned his head to a brown-haired Nord with a stately goatee. Ulfred, he nodded. Believe me. I understand your concerns, but I will not be opening Glorious Farm to auction until the companions and the guard have concluded their investigation. The area will remain under patrol, and the family's possessions will remain under lock and key. My Lord Jarl, that could take weeks. Why don't we- In the meantime, Balgriff continued, I will allow a dispatchment of workers to maintain the fields until a conclusion is reached. I offer both of you, concerned philanthropists that you are, the chance to donate a group of your farmhands to the effort. This company will leave immediately with a signed notice from Preventus to be allowed onto the premises. That notice will go to the first of you to approach my steward with a roster for the dispatchment. After letting his words settle, 
The Jarl looked to the balding man to his right. Preventus, the next item, if you please. Certainly, my Jarl. Captain Wester has reported no bandit counterattacks. The Valthame Towers, it appears, are secure. Rilgus was thorough, as always, I see. Commendations to Jorvatskar. Wester's men are settling in, but they are reporting that they could use a few more guardsmen to help them keep up their vigils through the night, and rations to boot. Get them what they need. Sir, if I may, we are stretched thin as it is, and Wester is indicating that there is no immediate threat. Proventus, I am well aware of our difficulties. However, I will not be complacent with the Lord of Eastmarch, and will not risk losing a foothold we have only now regained. It was at about this moment that several of the noble thanes awkwardly stood. Mumbling that they must take their leave, they all shuffled in a hushed race for the door. In their haste, they didn't notice the boy hiding in the corner. He was wiry, almost ill-cared for, but he could only get so thin living in the Jarl's house. Stringy brown hair like wet hay clung to his forehead. Midnight eyes glared daggers up at the man sitting on the throne. His father. You see? Came the voice in his ear. See how he turns the nobles against each other. Makes them solve his problems for him. I see him doing his best for the hold. He is doing his best for himself. He is not brave but cowardly, not noble, but insidious, duplicitous. See the ease with which he lies, he manipulates. He is wise. He is an oafish swine. He knows the threats those greedy men pose. Do you not suppose your mother ever posed a threat? No, she never... They will care! hissed a voice from over his shoulder. The boy turned with a start to see Fianna, maid and faithful caretaker of the castle. What are you doing skulking around like this, boy? And who was you talking to? I was just... The boy's eyes darted about. Watching father work. The silver-haired woman reached for his arm. These are no matters for children. Nilkir pulled away. I'm not just some child. I'm just son of the Jarl. This is my destiny. Fine, sick. Keep your voice down. Or do you want to be found out? The boy looked back to the hall a moment before relenting and allowing himself to be drawn away by the maid. Why shouldn't I be learning? I won't be a child for much longer. Your father knows that all too well. And with all the worries on his head, I trust he pines for those simple days himself. Please, boy, trouble yourself not with all this. Frothar troubles himself with it. He goes on and on about being your old one day. Your brother is full of gusto and hot air, but you don't see him eavesdropping on the courts and cavorting with the shadows. Because he's a fool. Because it's not his place. The woman lay a hand on the lad's shoulders. You'll get nowhere fast looking down on your family. Something your brother will come to learn as well, I should think. The pair stopped at a passage out of the hall, and the boy considered the motherly woman. You won't tell father about this, right? Relax, child. Why would I? Now get outside. It's good for your head. All right. Thanks. Nilkir mumbled before disappearing into the dim of the side passage. To Fianna's disquiet, she heard him continue muttering as he went. Vague whispers echoed back to her too low to discern. Stepping away, she reached for her broom. Strange child. And who would that be? Now it was Fianna's turn to tense and round on the voice. Before the matronly woman was a lady in green gown and gold shawl. Her light brown hair was tied up in a bun with an ornate necklace of rubies draped around her shoulders. Lady Alistair! My word, Fianna, I didn't mean to startle you. The silver-headed maid composed herself. Oh, not at all, young mistress. My old ears aren't what they used to be. I suppose even a mammoth could give me a fright. I'm sorry to hear it. Who were you talking about? Oh, I... I really shouldn't say. Was it Nelkia? Well, yes! Fiona blurted, allowing herself the gossip. I worry about the boy. As do I. You know, I could have swore I heard him talking to someone the other day, but when I rounded the corner, he was alone. Very strange, isn't it? 
I just know it's the same thing. I worry, but I don't want to bother the Jarl with it. Oh, of course not. If we truly suspect some darkness, we can consult with the wizard. Oh, but you know, he might be busy. Really? With what? Well, I saw that old geezer. You know the one. You remember that raggedy bloke that made a fuss over a sword in the entrance hall? I seem to remember hearing about it. I was rather new then. Oh, there was an old fellow with him. And now he's back. Been chatting with Farangar all morning. And you know how he gets with his projects. Especially now he's got that little mongrel running errands for him. Right. Her. Lady Olista seemed to reflect a moment. Well, speaking of errands, I must be off. Oh, where are you off to now? Back to the Wind District, I should think. But first, Rongor asked me to pass a notice along to Commander Caius. For the first time in the conversation, Alista's face soured. More specifically to one of the doormen who can then play runner. I swear, he's a frustrating man. To ask something so menial of a thing. Could be a sign that you're earning his favor. Can't be a bad thing for the brother of the Jarl to be relying on you. At this, Alista's face visibly reddened. Oh, don't be ridiculous. It's hardly that. If a man has taken interest in you, he'll look for any excuse to talk to you. I got where I am by disregarding the interests of men like him. Say, is a housecarl around? Oh, don't be shy, my lady. Fiona, housecarl. The maid's grin faltered as she suddenly understood that play had ended. Certainly, miss. I'll, I'll send for Lydia at once. Excellent. Alista adjusted her gown and straightened her hair. She's far better suited to this task than I. And besides, if Ronger truly wishes my company, I'm sure he won't object to my swift return. The maid's face split with girlish joy, <laughs> and her hushed giggles mixed with those of the young Thane whispered down the halls of Dragon's Reach Castle. The shadow of the great mountain was still upon them when Ayala spotted their first catch of the day. A dark shrouded pair sat at the head of a covered carriage, trundling toward them over the White River Bridge. Giving into the thrill of the chase, she spurred Pebble forward. The mare lurched into a gallop and she felt Stranger grip the back of her leathers to keep his face from slamming into her steel shoulder. He rode like a child, stiff and awkward. His hips hadn't found Pebble's rhythm, and too often was he being bounced rather than bouncing himself. Still, in spite of that, she felt comfortable with him back there. More than once she had to shake herself and remember that this stranger was little more than his namesake. Huffing in her frustration, she rode hard. They came upon the carriage as a saber cat comes upon a deer, radiating power and violent potential. The drivers cowered and stopped the cart as she circled. Stand and deliver! She called. State your business! They lowered their hoods as they stood. To a pair of Nord women. One seasoned and grey, the other hardened and brunette. We are but humble travellers looking for a new life. A curious hour to ride these roads. Ayela smelled their fear as she saw it dissipate. They had recognized her. As I live and breathe, exclaimed the elder. Hair like fire and eyes of blue steel. I don't suppose that makes you Ayla of the Companions? It does. Ayla grinned. By your surprise, I take it you're not from Whiterun. No, oh, Yelka is my name, of Clan Windrider. This is Deary, my son's wife. Ayla nodded at the stone-faced woman. We hail from Darkwater in Eastmarch. A bear took my son two years ago. The war has since taken two of his children. Ayala, suddenly understanding that hard edge in the younger woman's face, dropped from the saddle and sidled over. Oh, I see. Refugees, then. The old woman nodded solemnly. The Lord of Windhelm is wrapped up in his war. His vassals reap kin and crop to feed his ambition. Well, I've given enough, I see. And so has Derry. We've ridden two weeks now, hoping Whiterun had maintained its sanity, but we're come to find chaos in the air and rattling roads. You're not the first to stop us. Were you searched at the border? Oh aye, just yesterday. 
They were cordial and bright, but then a whole host of them descended on us in the night. And they were whipped up in some foul fury then. Hounds baying, searching us thrice over, and nearly drawing their weapons when the wee one ran out. The wee one? Burosk, out with you now. A hero is with us. From the hooded cart came a sound of tipping boxes and rummaging cloth. Like a squirrel in a tree, a tiny face appeared at the opening. Yelka held out an arm in presentation. Burosk Windrider, Lady Companion. Last living of Ingvil and Derry. The small boy's beady eyes scanned his surroundings curiously before widening as they fell upon her. They took in her auburn hair as a tundra breeze sent it dancing over her face. They took in her bow and white steel blade. Lastly, they rested on the emblem embossed on her shoulder. Ayala smiled kindly at him, but the boy was quick to retreat into the folds of the cart. The huntress took a deep breath and began to casually circle the cart. I am sorry for your plight, and sorry you're still that you've come to Whiterun at a most inopportune time. Innocent blood was spilt three nights ago, and suspicion is writing the news wherever it goes. As she stepped, her senses were primed. No lie had left their lips, and she couldn't pick up any wisp of the missing girl's scent. The wood of the carriage caught her attention. A lowland cedar, less fragrant than its alpine counterpart, but the scent was no less distinct. The faintest whiff of sulfur cast her mind back to hunting in snow-slushed mulch and resting in volcanic springs. East March and the Evermist Valley, Jordanpust. As she came back around in more than one sense, she looked at the stranger, still awkwardly adjusting himself on the back of Pebble. His eyes were down, and she had to click her tongue to get his attention. Even after his eyes met hers, it took a moment for him to pick up on the silent question. Comprehension dawning, he looked this way and that before offering her a less than subtle shake of the head. The old woman was looking between them, worry mounting when Ayala continued. Make for the western gate and stay on the road. You will be stopped again. Don't expect kindness. Make your intentions plain, as you have with me, and if anyone gives you trouble, mention my name. That should buy you civility at the very least. More in the right company? Oh, my thanks, madam. One more thing. Have you passed any other carriages? Oh, several, my lady. One was heading south. Two groups were making their way east. Thank you. Ayla flung herself back into the saddle. Go now, with my blessing. Not waiting for a response, she thundered away, riding as high on purpose as she did on the dappled mare. Ayala and the hunter raced the shadow of the morning to the nape of the great mountain, tucking themselves into the unassuming network of trails behind its ear well before the sun was high enough to light them. To the north, the land scooped into the great eastern saddle of the tundra, where the land fell and cupped the river as it left Whiterun, Waltam Towers waving to it as it went. From there, the land rose to the distant whitecaps, the nearest being a high peak sharp to eye and treacherous to foot, appropriately named Shear Point. The hunter squinted at the harsh ridge line as Ayala tied Pebble to a shrubby mahogany. It was odd seeing it so clearly. From the treehouse it was a distant spike of alabaster, hemmed in by cotton clouds hardly discernible from the surrounding summits. Now to see it filled him with a curious ambition. The irrational sense that if he only took the proper path, he might stand upon that frigid height one day. It was a feeling he never got about the mountain he now walked to the base of. For the throat of the world was not a mountain, rather a sacred tower, a stairway to the heavens only approachable by the greatest individuals mortality had to offer. He looked to Ayala. The morning ride had been a quiet one, partly due to his fatigue and partly due to the way Ayala's gaze stung him with its chill whenever she looked back at him. Not knowing what to make of it, he thought it best to focus on the task at hand. What's this place called again? He muttered. 
On the windswept foothills, one didn't need to shout for their voice to carry. It was the intense silence of open spaces. He knew Ayala could hear him just fine. White River Watch? Ayala said, producing a cloak from a pack on the side of her horse and swinging it around her armored shoulders. The name is quite literal. It's a cave hideout. The tunnel leads to a lookout high on a cliff with a good view of the road and the river. Every year or two, some group of bandits gets it into their head to ambush the caravans on the road using that cliff as a lookout and this cave as a base. Why doesn't the Jarl use it? Station guards here. That would keep it out of malicious hands, at least. Indeed. Why doesn't he bring the court wizard himself out here and have him collapse the caves and flood the grottoes? Ayala countered. I don't know. Maybe he's busy. And so are the guards. Captain Brew is keeping his people near town for the moment. It's up to us to explore all the cracks and crevices. I see. Besides, what card would want to be stationed out here? It would take a desperate man to live in a cave. Mm. The hunter pursed his lips. There have been days when I would have killed for a cave. Ayala walked up and lightly dug a finger into his ribs. <laughs> Case and point. Ah, funny, he said unconvincingly, eyes on the many bluffs above. Do they know we're coming? They might. It's early yet and light doesn't go far underground. Not sure I fancy that. The feeling like you're being watched or going underground? Both. Don't worry. As long as they don't know who we are, they'll likely rob us before they try to kill us. Ah, now there's a comfort. Relax. Ayala chided good-naturedly. Remember who you're with? The hunter sighed. The Wolf of Whiterun? That's right. I'll smell them coming before they get close. Just then, a north wind whipped by, and the hunter had to shield his face to stop his lips from going numb. Say, you got an extra cloak? Nope. Ayala said matter-of-factly, crouching up the small trail. But don't worry. There's not a lot of wind inside a cave. The hunter could not know the accuracy of the statement, but before he knew it, his thighs were filled with that dull fire that always came when walking uphill. The winding trail between bluffs and edges reminded him of the slopes below Helgen, if only in shape. The cliffs were not hard granite, but soft soil. He passed a lip topped with blooming tundra cotton, and could see where roots reached down through the cliff, extending into the open air beneath. For another thing, there were no trees. He had felt exposed before when leaving the cover of the forest for the plains of Whiterun, but now the likeness in these foothills exaggerated the contrast. He wanted to crawl. But he wanted more not to lose track of Ayala. Despite her crouched form, her speed through the hills was remarkable. He didn't see her draw her dagger, but suddenly he saw it flash in her hand as she rounded a corner. He followed, reaching for his blade. He was still reaching when she came into view and he saw her reason for caution. The trail had been blocked. Sharpened stakes reinforced by supporting posts. These more closely resembled the battlements of the Jarl city than the superficial bluff he had prepared for the beast. Beyond was a small camp. It was empty. A built pit of blackened stones, surrounded by worn dirt where a group had been sitting around a fire. Shovels leaning on rudimentary racks and knocked over chairs. A single arrow lay half buried in the dirt, its tail pointing to the mouth of the cave. The opening was taller than it was wide, as much a crack as a proper entrance. The hunter picked up the arrow, inspecting the heavy steel bodkin head of the thing. It had been fashioned to pierce armor. Handy tool for a highwayman. After inspecting the integrity of the shaft, he slid it into his own quiver and looked to Ayala. Does this tell us anything? Ayala nudged a chair with her foot and sniffed hard. No, she said, and looked to the cave entrance. Not yet. Offering no further explanation, she stalked toward the opening. The hunter hurried after her. Uh, shouldn't we light a torch? Don't need it she said, the sentence echoing as she disappeared into the black. The hunter was alone on the mountain. Shit, shit, shit! He cursed under his breath, shifting his weight uneasily. Maybe you don't, you fuzzy butt muncher. What about me? Another moment mired in unbearable solitude. 
Oh, Brack, she's gonna kill me. He surged forward and was eaten whole by the mountain. Before he knew it, he was high-stepping through the black, sure that his foot was about to catch on some unseen lip, and he would be plunged into a gaping chasm. The light had left him so suddenly, he hadn't even had a moment to look back and bid it farewell. Caves were bad, he decided as he took blind turn after blind turn, one hand stretched out in front, the other sliding along the wall. Caves could go straight to oblivion. Just when his anxiety was reaching its zenith, and his feet began to freeze up, a voice echoed all around him. Stranger, keep coming. I'm a little farther. Rounding the last corner, the hunter was surprised to find that he could see. He stood at the base of a tall, undulating chimney. High above, he could faintly see shafts of cold light setting just enough ambient glow that his eyes, now thoroughly adjusted to the black, could make out his surroundings. Ladders and scaffolding, riggings and platforms, leaning off branching nooks and serpent ways. Layers upon layers of ad hoc construction in places working with the curve of the rock, at others in defiance of it. Long cold braziers, pens, beds. It was a tubular township, a fort of stone unhewn by the tools of man. Remarkable. In fact, the least surprising thing about the whole scene was Ayella sitting on a pile of overturned crates like it was a throne. Hmm. Can't say this is what I was expecting to find, she said, her eyes dancing embers in the dark. They're all gone then? Well, I wouldn't say that. The huntress pointed at the ground between them. Bodies. The hunter started violently registering the lumpy shadows of inert human forms littering the stone. Furs and leathers, robes and hoods, flesh burnt and hanging off blackened bone, wounds dried and faces sunken in rigored, rasping reproach. Looking up at what he had taken for a rug hanging over a flimsy fence, now he saw it was a slumped man with a missing face. The hunter took a step back and felt a hand crunch beneath his foot. That was the last straw. Back into the black, back into feeling his way along the serpentine path, and back into the blinding morning. He could hear Ayala's irritated calls all the way, but he didn't care. The underground was breathtaking as it was hellish, but those did not look like corpses that would stay idle for long. About twenty minutes later, Ayala emerged to find him sitting on the ground next to an overturned chair, staring unseeing out over the tundra. She stood over him for a moment. She could hear him breathing in sharp little bursts. Just left me in there, huh? Some shield brother you are. She got no response. The half-breed was absently playing with his chin beard, eyes empty. Ayala's brow furrowed and she bent over, reaching down to him, concern evident. However, the hand froze inches from his shoulder. When finally he looked up, she quickly retracted the hand and stood tall, running it through her hair. The hunter wanted to go home. He thought that since the drama of Bleak Falls, the macabre offerings of this violent world would leave him like water off a duck's back. But it seemed that was too much to ask. He raised an eyebrow at her. I never said I was a shield brother. Plus, you've been telling me to leave it to you this whole time. Ayala nodded thoughtfully. Mm, guess I have. So, nothing felt vampirish in there? Nothing. Honestly, I wasn't thinking about it. <sighs> I see. Ayala rested her hands on her hips and looked to where he sat, next to the tipped chair. So what is this? Some kind of protest? Huh? Why aren't you just sitting in the chair? It's not my chair. It's a dead man's chair. That's some superstition of yours? The hunter shrugged moodily. I don't really care what it is. It's just the case. Fair. Ayala casually kicked the seat upright and parked her hips. What did you learn? I don't think this was the vampire's doing. Who else, then? I don't think it was someone else, either. I think it was them. The hunter paused in his idle ministrations. Explain. 
Everyone in armor or fur or leather was burned or frostbitten or almost burst from the inside. Everyone in a robe was cut, chopped, or riddled with arrows. What does that sound like to you? The hunter furrowed his brow against the tundra wind. Uh, a fight? Looks like it. Mages versus bandits. Shame there aren't any survivors hanging around, though. Seems like the tale of what happened here would settle a few barroom wagers. Do you think it was a case of infighting? Magic crafters banding together, or Nords continuing their ageless vendetta against mages? No. There were no arcane accoutrements inside. This was a run-of-the-mill bandit hole till the wizard showed up. As for what they came for, and why they decided to come here, that's anyone's guess. They all wore this, though. Reaching into a pocket, she produced a loop of cord fixed with an odd talisman, a blazing sun half-shrouded by a moon. The hunter reached out and examined the marking, a sign of the eclipse. Do you know it? No, I've never seen it, but the symbology is pretty obvious, no? I guess? That court mage with the assistant might know. Ferengar secret fire. Brack is probably already on his way now to ask him about vampires. Right. The hunter nodded before standing. <sighs> Let's crack on, then. Ayla stood and stretched with enough emphasis to knock the chair back onto its side. You know, I've actually met that assistant. The one with the tail? Yep. What's she like? A bit strange. Well, that's a given. Very cute, though. Really? Oh, yeah. Mistake cute? Ayla laughed as the pair wound their way down the hills and back to the horse. <laughs> we'll see. Four! Four lousy books! In a reclusive study lit by a pale white globule of light, deep in the winding halls of Dragon's Reach Castle, Farangar Secret Fire pinched his brow irritably. <sighs> I am certainly sorry to disappoint, especially considering you're coming from such an esteemed hall of knowledge as <clears throat> your Vasker. I could have expected as much from a bloody wizard came Bracknell's petulant response. Oh, I'm sure you know exactly what to expect from a wizard. Indeed, there are much grander libraries than my own. If it truly vexes you, I would direct you to the Arcanium in the College of Winterhold. The number of books is hardly the point you up-jumped janitor. In my day, we had wise men, capable of settling the most obtuse dispute. Now it's all fields of study and libraries. Oh, I can't help you. Go halfway across the bloody province and dig up an arcanium. Never mind being able to answer a few simple questions about an undead scourge. Oh, please, this is hardly topical. And as for those wise men, oh, I can only dream at the eye-crossing brain teasers faced in those miserable little villages of yours. The skinny Nord's face was turning slightly red under his brown mutton-chop beard. Indeed, I should think I'd fare well enough if I were called on to cure a case of gout, or assist in the coupling of goats, or if the farmers come to mention it. However, vampires are an enigma even among the most learned circles. There are commonalities in the scattered accounts, but nothing I can stake my hard-won reputation on. Bracknell crossed his arms and glared at the hooded man. You wouldn't know the difference between coupling goats and a stack of piss pots. Truly, my biggest failure as a man. I'm not asking you to stake your reputation. I want your opinion. No, you want my assistance, countered the wizard. And these books are the best I can do. Now, are you willing to accept these texts as help, or shall I put them away? Will you at least read the books yourself? Educate yourself that you might actually be of use next time this comes up. I'm afraid the duties of a court mage are not so lightly tossed aside. Fine, fine. The old Nord leaned back and waved his hand. I suppose I'll take these and be on my way. Oh no. Those books do not leave the castle. You have it on the honor of your Vasker that they will be returned unspoiled. I'm sorry, but there are no exceptions. 
I can lend you the use of a meeting room a few doors down and of my assistant if you feel you won't be able to complete your research in a timely manner. I need no help, as philistine as I might seem to you, but I'll gladly welcome the change in company. Very well. Nim, Farangar called irritably, please escort this man out of my study. Appearing out of nowhere came a short, white-haired girl with elven ears in revealing fur garb, so revealing he could easily see the long, white-furred tail protruding from behind. Bracknell raised an eyebrow at first, but quickly recovered and dropped into a bow. A pleasure, my lady. Sure, the girl replied in a bright voice and scooped up the books, leading the old Nord down the hall. At the crest of day, the hunter and Ayala stopped a caravan headed by a morose-looking Dunmer merchant. Apparently, she'd come all the way from the Ashlands of Morrowind, hoping her exotic wares would turn a profit in the bustling markets of Whiterun. Unfortunately, the Nords, it seemed, were a cautious crowd, and she was now on her way to the city of Windhelm, praying to Azura that the Dunmer living in the slum-like Grey Quarter would salvage her venture. She was openly resentful of Aela's search, and chattered incessantly at both the Huntress and her own subordinates. The workers kept surreptitiously stepping in front of boxes and stowing pouches in their clothes. It seemed she thought the search was all some Nordic ploy to steal her valuables under the guise of seizing contraband. The hunter had to suppress a laugh. What the merchants revealed or hid made little difference. Whether a tirade or banal pleasantries, the Wolf of Whiterun could pull the truth from it. This woman couldn't imagine the information Ayla could glean just by being near her caravan. His mirth faded as the process progressed. More and more he noticed the disgruntled eyes of the Dunmer straying from the snooping huntress and settling on him. Why was he there? Watching silently over the proceedings like some high chief. What did it mean when the esteemed wolf of Whiterun looked to him for a sign? Ayla had made it clear that his days of mundanity were behind him. If this kept up, his anonymity would be the next casualty. About an hour later, the hunter and Ayla sat on a hilltop on the eastern edge of the plains, sheltering from the noon sun under a lonely heath. They had stuck their heads in several other suspicious crags to no avail. Now the Huntress had insisted they rest here and take a modest lunch. The Hunter was acutely aware that the Wolf of Whiterun needed no break, so the question came down to whether it was he or the horse that was being pitied. This question, however, was quickly forgotten with the appearance of the rations. The Hunter chewed eagerly on bread and dried meat, determined to relinquish none of what he'd been given. Dragon's Reach and its high eastern wall filled the landscape to the west, while in the Great Saddle to the east, the pair could just barely pick out a thin line. The bridge at Valtheim Towers. Beyond lay the falls, casting its haze as if to shield Eastmarch from view. Above that misty gateway flew a drift of tundra swans, probably still settling in for the summer. As he watched the pale flock carry on like a racing cloud, it struck him that this moment was nothing less than serene. A cool wind eased his burns and tousled his hair. The scene grew unfocused in the deafening peace of it all. However, when he glanced to Ayella, the huntress's eyes had lost none of their steely focus as they dissected the landscape. Don't you ever sleep? He asked. No, not really. She replied in a bored voice. Sometimes I dream. Sometimes I remember. Sometimes I rest. But I never sleep. Is that part of your power? I always have my wits about me. She said. And the hunt waits for no one. The hunter took another bite. Shay, something just occurred to me. Let's hear it. Well, it's... 
It's just that I'm a hunter, and you're the huntress. Stranger, is this your way of flirting with me? The hunter rolled his eyes. No, I... Because I have to say, it's quite terrible. Oh, great skies. <laughs> you know I practice being terrible at flirting? Really? Yeah. My plan is to be so repulsive, I can drive any foe away <laughs> with a sappy line and a wink. I imagine one day a great troll will be moments away from ripping me to shreds, and I'll shout, Oh, fair wind-swept lummock, how I am begot by that glint in your claws and the beautiful symmetry of your third eye. Pray, come away with me and dance across the breadth of the night's twinkling diamond sky. And then <laughs> it'll get all freaked out and run away. He could hear Ayala laughing through her nose, and when she spoke, her smile was clear in her voice upsetting as it might be to hear I don't think that'll work <laughs> that is upsetting he said wiping off his mouth why would you ever doubt me it's not you I doubt it's the troll the huntress countered giving the half-breed pause just now you were far too charming a few drinks in and I might fall for a line like that the hunter guffawed <laughs> third eye and all a stranger, there's no quicker way into a woman's heart than complimenting her third eye. She held her thumb and forefinger in a ring against her forehead. I'm quite proud of mine. <laughs> the pair of them giggled lightly in a way that felt staunchly opposed to the serious task before them. Eventually, Ayala sighed. <sighs> what was your thought again? <laughs> My what? You said something occurred to you about being a hunter and all that? Oh, right. Uh, he rubbed his forehead. It just seemed that we have very different views on the idea of hunting. We, we use a lot of the same tricks and techniques, you likely to a greater extent given your you-ness. Thank you. But I hunt to feed myself. It's a matter of survival for me. You live in your Vascar. You're noble, by my standards at least. You still eat what you hunt, but you don't need to. And yet... You speak of the hunt with this reverence, like it's a person actually waiting. Is there a question at the end of this? I was just wondering what hunting is to you. Hmm. Ayla sat back, rolling a crumb of bread between her fingers, and considered. You, you already know of her scene, yes? Yeah, we've spoken of them. Well, I doubt it will surprise you, that being the root of my lycanthropy... I hold them in some esteem. They are my guide and ideal. They have taken my prowess as a warrior to heights undreamed of by even the most mead-soaked Nords. Surely the credit isn't Hircene's alone. Were you not a warrior and a huntress long before you were a werewolf? <laughs> I was a whelp. I was a wiry girl, quick on her feet and deft with a bow. Then my mother showed me the way of the hunt and brought me to her scene. In the hunt, all the hypocrisies of society slip away. It is my worship, my pursuit, my purest form, where I bring to bear all that I strive for. She locked eyes with him. So, with all that behind me, I suppose it's only natural that I come off as a tad zealous? Yeah, <laughs> I suppose. The hunter smiled. Where is your mother? He asked without thinking. She's... Ayala trailed off suddenly, breath slowing and body stiffening. What does it matter to you? Danger suddenly flared in the hunter's mind, and he looked to see Ayala regarding him through harsh, narrowed eyes. Stranger? Yesterday it was friend, today it's stranger. And you make both sound like an insult. That's your name, isn't it? I never said that. Then what is your name? I can't tell you. You can't, or you won't. Ayala stood sharply, fists clenched. Unwilling to back down, he followed suit. Oh, what's in a name? I can hear the words on your tongue. Deflect again and again. Oh, it's all some big joke, right? Then why would you hide it from me? What significance could your name have that you would hide it from everyone? Answer me! I... can't. Then why, in oblivion, 
would I tell you about my mother? Why would I ever let you live? Knowing what you know, why would I? The huntress caught herself and spun. It's time to go. Get your ass on the horse. Ayala. Stranger, horse, now. Ah, she's got a name, you know. Good for her. Ayala huffed, pulling herself into the saddle. She's got you, B. As the Aedra are the light, the Daedra are the darkness. Wretched, howling abominations that prey on the lives and happiness of mortals as a house cat torments a field mouse. Though perhaps it is wrong to describe the Daedra simply as the antithesis, the shadow cast by the benevolence of the Nine Divines. Even in that darkness there is texture. The plains of oblivion are vast and varied, distinct as each of those twisted pools where hate and ambition coalesce, known as Daedric Princes. Among them there is one whose heart sings most hollow, a Daedric Prince whose cruelty and malice are a wonder even among that unholy court. The Lord of Lies, Father of Cold Harbor, Schemer Prince, King of Strife, Enslaver of Mortals, Harvester of Souls, Lord of Rape, Molag Bal. Bracknell might have known that worm would be mixed up in all this. In a long stone room with tall windows and many tables, he combed the grim encyclopedia known as the Book of Daedra. He'd come across sickening details of rituals between Molag Bal and his followers. The benefactors of these rituals apparently became full-blooded vampires, granted immortality and deadly power. Power that seemed to diminish with each generation of vampiric progeny. Unfortunately, in all the explorations, concrete and hypothetical, surrounding the dreadful prince, there was no information on how to spot vampires, track them, or fight them. Still, the descriptions of what those mortals were made to endure were enough to put him off his lunch and urge him to shield the pages from the eyes of his carefree companion. She, for her part, dove into an old medical compendium, but at some point she had stopped turning the pages and now sat still, chin in her chest. Bracknell, weary of the tapestries of woe before him, cleared his throat. <clears throat> Lady Nim. The white-haired girl twitched awake with a snort and rubbed her eyes. Yes, hello, sorry, what? Have you found anything useful? The girl stretched her arms and fumbled with the incomprehensible pages before her. Oh, no, not yet. What were we looking for again? Vampires. Oh, right. The elven mix yawned and blinked rapidly. I found, um, uh, something. How about you? Bracknell sighed. Nothing useful. A bunch of images I could have lived without, but nothing that would tell us how to find them. Or better yet, fight them. Are you going to fight them? Nim asked, taking in his aged frame. I would, certainly. But I unfortunately might not get the chance. As soon as one of those marauding bastards sees me, they'll be scared halfway back to oblivion. <coughs> oblivion? Aye, that's the one thing I did learn, actually. Turns out we have a Daedra to thank for these bloodsuckers. Did the book say which? Who else but the worst of the worst? Molag Bal. His study companion's breath caught, and she went eerily still. It was such an abrupt change the old Nord stiffened himself and looked up. The girl's maroon eyes were huge. He'd never beheld eyes like that, and for all her cat-like features, in that moment, she looked like a scared albino rabbit. Lady Nim? He asked. Are you okay? M m m m molag Bal, are you certain? Well, that's really a question for the book, but yes, vampires are the result of his profane rituals. Nim sat up straight and started rapidly flipping through the pages before her, tail twitching agitatedly behind her shoulders. What was the last we heard? Are they in the city? 
No, no. A uh, farm far to the north was attacked. Bracknell raised an eyebrow at her sudden change in demeanor. I take it you're familiar with that particular Daedra? In response, the white-haired girl pointed to a page in the healer's guide before her. Here, she said. Sanguinaire Vampyrus. That's got to be something, right? Bracknell leaned forward. Sure, sounds like a good place to start. The shadow of the great mountain was long gone. The sun had fallen helplessly westward, and the pair had come north enough that the eastern sky was open to them. They trotted along, parallel to the White River, as they at last entered the great eastern saddle. Grasses had become patchy, and the land was suffused with small rocks. It was a subtle shift from the green and gold sea further west. No rolling, roseate waves, no quaint acres of farmland. Something in the earth was harder here, less accommodating to crops and farmers alike. The hunter's eyes focused on an alder, kissing the river to the left of the road. In the top branches, he spotted the distinctive profile of a raven, a grim omen, but comforting all the same. He had long ago gone cross-eyed with the brightness of the tundra. The vast azure sky was dizzying after a few hours. The hold was so big and open, everything seemed so far away. Frankly, he was sick of looking at it. The simple tableau of a bird and a tree was quite refreshing to this woodland transplant. They had interviewed another caravan moving east, merchants like the last with hired swords carrying grain, swine, candles, and sujama. Among them was a wagon driven by a pair of yellow-sashed guardsmen bound for the Valtime Towers, it was heavy with vittles, weapons, and clothes. The cart also smelled suspiciously of mead, the lifeblood of Whiterun's finest. To the back was a traveling carriage driven by a man named Bjorlum. None of the occupants struck him as remarkable, save one. Between the Breton with the weather-worn skin and a sour face and the noticeably glum orc was a wiry Nord man, lean, muscled arms exposed, calling himself Vipper. It wasn't so much anything he did or said, but how he smelled. Some tinge in the air around the man felt familiar to the hunter, but it was too subtle for him to readily hone in on. During the brief questioning, most all answers were similar. No, they hadn't seen the missing girl, they hadn't spoken to any mages, nor had they come across any terrors of the night. The guardsmen seemed quite enthused by the prospect of helping with the infamous investigation, but alas, knew nothing more than the companion. The man named Vipper confessed that while he had heard the rumblings, he hadn't really concerned himself with the local news, considering his impending departure. They left the caravan behind, feeling a shade morose at the fruitless day. It was with waning conviction that they investigated the next two suspicious spots, particularly as one was little more than a hollow under a bridge. When the hunter asked what nefarious numbskulls were known to live there, Ayala had muttered, Trolls and mud crabs. They weren't looking for trolls and mud crabs, but he hadn't pressed the issue. After she'd snapped at him earlier, he hadn't said much. The ride was teetering on miserable. The wolf of Whiterun had a short fuse, and the hunter was saddle sore for the first time in his life. To Ayala's credit, her eyes had not wavered in intensity once throughout the day. The way she scanned the horizon gave the sense that she knew exactly what she was looking for, and just not seeing it. He, on the other hand, was hopeless. The rhythm of the horse oscillated from trot to canter to the occasional gallop where the terrain allowed. On these occasions, he unashamedly held the straps of Ayala's armor and tucked himself behind her. Her scent put him in mind of flying through the forest last night, of rolling on the ground during their sparring, of holding her as she cried for Bracknell. These memories threatened to pull him into sleep, and his head began to roll loosely on his shoulders. Whether she sensed this or merely resented his closeness, he was abruptly roused by a sharp elbow in the ribs. He didn't know what had pissed her off. Was it truly his name? Sure, she had never been impressed by it, but he didn't think it had bothered her that much. 
drowsiness nipped at his edges yet again, and he was driven to conversation to avoid another taste of elbow. Hot day, he commented, far from his best conversation opener. I wouldn't say that, Ayala muttered. Just sunny. I almost prefer a cave to this. Well, you're in luck. We've got another one ahead of us. The hunter sighed and lay back on the mound of tack. His proximity was immediately missed, it seems, as Ayala twisted in the saddle to look back at him. <sighs> What's wrong with you? Hmm? The hunter glanced up at her as his head gently bounced on Pebble's hips. Don't lay down on Pebble. She doesn't seem to mind. Yes, she does, and you'll mind when you get dizzy. I'm already dizzy. Then you'll fall off. <laughs> like you'd ever let that happen. Stranger, I will make that happen. Is this really what the Wolf of Whiterun does all day? Ayala pursed her lips and blew air out her nose. More or less, when I'm not training, drinking, or taming the odd guard. The hunter chuckled softly. <laughs> do they know that's how you phrase it? <laughs> the cute ones do. Anyway, what's your point? My point is, this isn't what I pictured when I imagined the ceaseless adventure that is the life of a companion. Ayala blinked at him. Stranger, when you met me, I was hiding in a bush, waiting for a giant that never came. Oh, yeah. And then you spent the better part of the next week knocking me around. Yep. Ayala smiled at the memory. You were quite the diversion. Wait a second. The hunter sat up on his elbows. Was I a... Chew toy? Ayala's face quirked and she turned back to the road ahead. Oh, Skies, I was, wasn't I? Of course not, she said unconvincingly. You are a talented hunter and burgeoning warrior, and I have nothing but respect for you. And? The huntress glanced back at him. I'm not gonna say it. The hunter's hands slammed over his eyes. Oh, you practically just did. Ayala repressed a laugh. Relax, it's no great crime to be diverting, nor is it a burden. She winked. I should know. The hunter squinted up at the sky through his fingers and sighed, relaxing against the rocking of the horse's haunches. This was progress. Say, he began, how is Brack? Is he breathing okay? The huntress rolled her shoulders. Yeah, it's steady. He's up, eating and moving, and that's enough for now. Is he stir-crazy yet? I'm sure he is, but Codlack is giving him lessons on how to be an old fart. I'm sure his performance will be stellar. The hunter chuckled, turning his head to watch the rolling fields of Whiterun stretch further and further away. How about you? Tired of looking after him? We're not talking about me. It's just a question. Oh, isn't it just... Ayala's head dropped to her chest, then lolled back in a tired sigh. <sighs> You know, I chased down a guard to learn about this. By here scene, I was so excited. Any excuse to get out of the city. A rough bear, a break-in, a fire, those fucking giants finally coming back to Palasia. I was happy. I was ready. Then it turns out a whole farm got massacred, and some little girl is stuck in oblivion for all we know. <sighs> Stupid. I don't think so. Oh, yeah? Eh, you can't know what you don't know. And if you got that pent up, then you must have been quite the devoted wet nurse. Ayala guffawed at this. <laughs> I was a horker of a wet nurse. Gods, I berated him into eating, mocked him when he stumbled, and practically threw him at his bed when he needed a rest. Still, the hunter said evenly, I don't reckon there's anyone he would have rather had than you. Silence stretched between them. The hunter tensed and looked to her, thinking she was getting ready to thump him in response. Yet, she hadn't turned around. What do you know of family, stranger? Nothing. Which is why I know it's important. Is that why you yelled at the steward? Right. I forgot about that. That was the same night you broke my head. Nearly broke your head. And I wouldn't have even been there if you hadn't gone mad like that. God, so much has happened. I barely remember that. Your first time in the oldest house in Whiterun, and you don't remember it? Okay, first of all, find yourself a pig and explain to them why Skyforge steel is so superior to the work of a tinker. Secondly, give that pig brain damage and see if he remembers. Thirdly, I... I mean, it wasn't that bad, was it? 
<laughs> wasn't that bad. Stranger, I am genuinely surprised that I haven't seen a warrant or even a bounty for you. Really? Hugh shouted in the face of the right hand of the Jarl. Preventus is a fair man by all counts. Certainly good at his job, but he can be petty. What he can be is a horse's ass. By Hersene, what's got you so hot about this? I don't know. I guess I, I've i always assumed a father was supposed to... <sighs> the hunter pinched the bridge of his nose. Just forget it. Point is, I don't like him. Point is, he's not someone to cross. Well, it's a damn good thing I avoid guards at every chance. We are riding to a guard outpost right now. Oh. The hunter felt his stomach sink slowly as he considered this. Okay. How about I steal a beard from a goat and hide out in your vasker? It's the last thing they'll expect. I could get a jump on being an old fart with Codlack. Ayla shook her head, but he could hear the smile in her voice. Spend enough time with him and I'm sure you'll learn. They'll all smile and call you an old soul. I've already got the limp down. Really? Yeah, uh... The hunter grunted, reaching for his knee. It's just a twinge, but it flares up from time to time. For how long? Since that night with the witch, he settled. I reckon there was something important in that piece of calf I lost. Either way, I can hobble with the best of them. Ayla smiled at the road ahead. I imagine you're right. Shame there isn't a race for that. We could make one. (laughs) Three laps around your Vasker and up to the Skyforge. Disqualify anyone who doesn't look like they're in pain. We could, but wouldn't it break your heart when I start rooting for the old man instead of you? Bracknell or Codlack? Both. The pair of them laughed easily for a moment, and the air between them seemed to clear. Say, the hunter began sitting up. Speaking of Codlack, I was wondering about what you told me that night. Hmm? About not helping him if he was to ask something of me. Ah. Ayala paused. Well, he wasn't the one training you. I was. If anyone deserved your gratitude, it would be me. But the companions only welcomed me into your Vasker because Codlack welcomed me. The hunter adjusted himself in the saddle. And I can be grateful to both of you. Why would you begrudge him my favor? That makes no sense. Sense has got nothing to do with it, Pop. What does that mean? Stranger... I just... Ayala trailed off and placed a hand on the side of her head. Let's just get to town. I need a drink. Are you alright? Terrible fucking question. Is that a no? There's a little girl out there somewhere getting tortured by fucking vampires. We haven't found a damn thing all day and now we have to stop and sure sip for the night. You're a prick. I'm hunting a prey I can't even smell and we are both just shooting the wind about it. Now get your head on a swivel before I even out your limp. Look what's wrong with you. Why are you snapping at me like this today? Oh, do you think you deserve better? Frankly, yes. After what we've been through, I think I do. Stop talking like you know me. Do I not? (laughs) We have spent maybe a week together total. You are no one to me. And yet you thought it was a good idea to come out here with me and no one else. Of course. You're a tool. More people would slow me down and why should I hesitate? It's not like you could do a single thing to harm me. Are you so sure about that? I don't pretend to know a lot of things, Ayala, but I know pain when I see it. And I... I'm beginning to feel like it's my fault. And that's not fair. You brought me here. Ayala's head drooped and the mount came to a slow stop. After a moment's stillness, the huntress was out of the saddle. I'm walking ahead. Pebble knows to follow me. Ayala. Stranger! No more questions. Not now. The hunter huffed and bit down on his words. The ride turned icy as the distant peaks they rode towards, and remained that way into the evening.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Skyrim Audio Adventure. As I said in the intro, it was an ordeal to get this one produced, so... Oi, on to the next. My goal, personally for myself, is to try to make some progress on getting that hard copy of the first season out, and also get all the way to Chapter 6 by the New Year. Ayela the Huntress was once again played by Cat Loveland. Farangar's Secret Fire was played by Toby J. Smith. Unfortunately, due to sickness and bad timing, Mafuria was unable to reprise her role as a Nim, so I filled in for her on this episode. Hopefully we'll get her back in the next episode. We wish her the utmost health and fortune. Riley Star McLean is back, this time in the role of Elorine, Ayala's mother. Jarl Balgruf the Greater and his brother Hrongar were both played by Chris Kov Viking Voice Coleman. Ulfred Battleborn was played by Max Lefferts. The infamous Nazim was played by Brian C. Sundin. Preventus Avenici was played by James Fagan. Nelkir was played by Dizzy Lee V.A. Nancy O'Fallon returns to the project, this time as the dark voice in Nelkir's head. Fiona was played by Renara Hawk. Lady Olista was played by Carolina Jerez Longres. And finally, Yelka Windrider was played by Hannah Hebblethwaite. Having a cast this broad and talented is as daunting as it is exciting, and I have enjoyed working with each and every one of you. I must be off now, time to start working on the next one. We're halfway through summer, the days are getting shorter, but it's still pretty darn hot, so stay cool out there everyone. And once again, thanks for listening.